Hello everyone, this is Jason from Primetime Aquatics and I've got a video I'm very excited to finally share with you. It's one I've been wanting to do for a long time and that is a top 10 common fish that can be difficult to keep alive sometimes and a lot of people have expressed frustration, especially over these fish. We're going to take a closer look at why. Now primarily what I've done is I focus on fish that you would normally find at a pet store. Everything I'm saying in this video can be negated if the pet store is quarantining their fish properly and they are buying from reputable sources. Unfortunately, especially for a lot of the big box stores and some pet stores who maybe don't put enough effort into sourcing their fish, these fish can be a particular problem. Now, I have broken up our categories into four separate sections. We're going to be looking at fish based on their genetics, are they prone to disease, their adaptability to different water parameters, and how well they ship. And I'm keeping in mind when we're talking about shipping, the entire process. Maybe they, these fish have been bred overseas and they go to an exporter, then they go to an importer, then they go to a wholesaler, then they go to the pet store, and finally they wind up at your home. And so I'm keeping in mind that entire process as I talk about and as I assign numbers to each one of these fish. Hope you enjoy the video. Appreciate you being here. Now this first one might be a little bit of a surprise to some of you. Number 10 on the list is the bristlenose pleco. I gave it a four for travel stress, six for water parameter range, eight for disease, and eight for poor genetics. That equals a total of a 26. Let's talk about why. So the first thing, travel, weakness or adaptability. This is only for very small bristlenose plecos. When they're larger, they tend to do much better. And if you're, again, if you're getting them from a breeder, whole different story. But if you're buying them from a pet store, just understand they don't like to be bagged up. They don't like varying water parameters. And so that's why I gave it a low number uh, just for adaptability. A lot of times people bring these home like, I don't understand. I was feeding them and they just didn't last very long, usually a few days. And that can often be why they get a little bit stressed out. Their water parameter range, again, this is really when they're small and when they've been shipped all over the world and they wind up in your aquarium. Sometimes they don't adapt well to different water parameters. I will say that they are fairly resilient. I don't see a lot of disease in bristlenose plecos and so far breeding has been great. I don't see a lot of curved spines or messed up fins or anything like that. You're looking at some of our breeding tanks here throughout this part of the video. So overall, again, if you get larger bristlenose, they tend to do a little bit better. Definitely if you get them from someone who's bred them locally, will do much better. Just be a little bit careful when you buy them from a store. The next one on my list is the angelfish, particularly if they're small around the size of a nickel. I give them a four for travel stress, a seven for water parameters, seven for disease, and seven for genetics. Total of 25. Again, they're not bad, especially if you can get them larger, get them from a breeder. They're going to do a lot better. But sometimes the ones you buy in the store that are especially small, people have found out when they buy a group of them, sometimes they don't all survive. I think a big reason for that, kind of like the bristlenose pleco when they're younger, is the fact that they just don't travel well. They don't like to be cold, which leads us to the other one, and that is water parameter range. Now, typically for the angelfish that are a little bit older, like you're seeing here, they can deal with changes in pH a little bit more, or at least a wider range of pH and water hardness. But when they're small, they're especially susceptible to disease if they wind up being in the wrong water parameters or they get shocked with water that's too cold. They can also be a little bit prone to stressing out when you first add them to a tank. Genetics wise, they do pretty good. You don't see a lot of issues at a pet store with bent fins, at least not in the pet stores around us. Uh, body shape is pretty decent. So if you're gonna get angelfish, it's probably better to get them a little bit larger. Spend the extra money. And I know small angelfish are cheap and they're cute, but when you can get the larger angelfish, they're probably going to do a little bit better in your aquarium to start. By the way, if you're looking for species profiles on the fish that we talk about in this video, check out the description below. We'll have all kinds of species profiles there if you want to learn more. This next one might be a little surprising. Coming in at number eight is the betta. And that's because, well, one, travel stress is fine. Uh, water parameters, a seven, disease, a six, poor genetics, a two for a total of 24. As you can see, it rates pretty high in most categories. Bettas generally travel very well. Uh, they don't really get all that stressed out when they're in a bag and they can take a little bit of changing water parameters. And they have a fairly wide range of water parameters. 
They're not particularly prone to disease unless, and this last point is where I ding them pretty hard, they have poor genetics. And unfortunately, we're seeing this more and more, especially as bettas have become more popular. The genetics sometimes just aren't that great from some of your store-bought bettas. And what we wind up seeing later on and really not that long after purchase is possibly the beginning of tumors. They seem to be a little bit more prone to things like bacterial infections. And so that can sometimes reduce the longevity of a betta. And so because of that, store-bought bettas can really be hit or miss. A lot of times you buy them, they live a long time, and then other times you're wondering why you just can't keep them alive for more than six months to a year because healthy bettas should be living for at least three, four, five years. And when you're getting those bettas that are only living for six months to a year, something is definitely wrong. And usually it has something to do with poor genetics. Coming in at number seven is the very beautiful Rummy Nose Tetra, but there are some issues. You can see here travel stress. They don't travel well. I give them a five. I gave them a six for water parameters, a three for disease, an eight for genetics for a total of 22. Now, the travel issues, they don't like to travel all that well. They tend to stress fairly easily. And if they get cold, that can lead to some disease issues as well. Water parameter range, I give them a six. Now, it's not like they're super picky like some of the other Tetras, but they're also not as resilient as some of the more resilient Tetras like the, let's say the Black Neon. The big one and where they find a major point deduction is prone to disease, and they certainly are. The worst cases of ick I have ever seen in my life came from rummy nose Tetras. One minute, they're fine. The next minute, you're like, what is that, a spot? And I'm not kidding you, within 24 to 36 hours, they are overrun with ick and very, little chance of them surviving in some cases. Now, the genetic side of things, they're pretty good. I think most of the issues that happen are because they really just want to be happy in their natural water parameters. And that range, once you get too far out of that, whether the pH is too high or the water hardness is too high, they don't necessarily like that. And then, like I said, they are one of those fish that are very, very prone to ick, especially if they are stressed out when they are traveling. So a couple things to look at. One, you might want to stay away from the wild caught rummy nose. If you can get tank bred rummy nose, that's great. If you can find a pet store that is properly quarantining fish, I will put a video in the upper right hand corner that shows you how that is done from a fish store perspective. That can help a lot as well. This next one is a little rough, comes in at number six, the Electric Blue Jack Dempsey, travel stress an eight, water parameter ranges an eight, disease a three, poor genetics a two for a total of 21. Obviously, the first two, they do just fine. They travel well. They adapt well. Gave them an 8 out of 10. In terms of water parameters, they're fairly adaptable. I have kept these fish at a pH as high as 8. They can certainly go down into the upper 6s and around neutral. The real issue is with the Electric Blue Jack Dempsey. And one, personally, I haven't been able to figure out. I have never been able to get these fish to grow past around 3 and a half inches or so before they start developing major issues, whether that's tumors or bent spines or all kinds of just abnormalities that I just simply cannot get them to grow. And I'm not the only one. There's been a lot of people that have had this same issue and it's really kind of frustrating and it really has to do with poor genetics. At least that is what we've seen in our area. And again, I know there can be exceptions to these rules, but these fish just genetically, I don't think they're quite there yet. I don't think that electric blue gene is all that stable. And I believe that is the reason why these fish really start to decline fairly rapidly. Once you get to two and a half to three inches, you start to see some fairly serious genetic abnormalities. And so that's why this is one fish you gotta be careful, especially because they're very expensive. They used to be much more so, but even still now, it's not uncommon to go to a pet store and find these fish for 10, 15, $20 a piece, and you really don't know what you're gonna be getting for that money. This is one where it's really important. If you know somebody who's breeding these fish and the parents look good, you might have a better chance of, of success. I hope you've enjoyed those first five fish, and we're gonna get back to that countdown in a second, but I wanted to make you aware, if you don't know already, Primetime Aquatics has partnered with Amazonas Magazine. If you're not familiar with Amazonas Magazine and you love fish, you should be. 
This is a very high quality magazine that is going to make you feel like a fish expert when you get done reading. It is something that we have absolutely loved in our home for many, many years, and it is a must have for a fish keeper. Very, very high quality. This is by far the best fish publication and our favorite publication, bar none, out there today. High quality, high quality print, high quality articles, high quality pictures. This is a fish magazine where if you want to learn more about fish, if you want to discover fish you never knew existed, this is the magazine for you. We actually have a special offer down in the description below. If you click on that Amazonas link, you will get a discount and it is going to be great. It's six issues a year. You really can't go wrong. All right, next one on this list is the German Blue Ram and the other derivatives of the German Blue Ram. I give it travel stress a three, water parameter range a three, disease a seven, poor genetics a seven for a total of 20. Now, some of you are going to say right from the start that a lot of the problems that happen with the German Blue Rams and the alternative versions of those fish are mostly user error, fish keeper error, and I would agree with that. The problem with the German Blue Ram is one, it's not very adaptable to different types of water parameters. It doesn't like to travel and it stresses very easily. Now what winds up happening is, especially for a lot of less than experienced fish keepers, they buy German Blue Rams because of the amazing color that you're seeing. And usually they're not paying close enough attention to their water parameters in terms of does the water hardness, is that really ideal? Is the pH ideal? These fish would really like to be up into the low 80s and a lot of people don't realize that and they start to have issues. Now when it comes to diseases and genetics I gave them a 7 for both because they're really not prone to a lot of disease unless they're not being kept in the proper water parameters and for the most part the genetics they seem to be mostly okay but the big thing here and the cautionary tale is if you're going to get the German Blue Rams and like I said, and the other color forms, you just want to be really careful that you're keeping them in water parameters that's best for them long term. And that's higher temperatures than you're used to keeping other fish in. It'd be nice if that pH was around a seven or below and water hardness that was in the mid to low single digits for your GH and KH. Coming in at number four is the discus. Let me explain why. Travel stress is a three, water parameter range is a four, disease is a four, genetics is an eight for a total of 19. Clearly, we've got a few things that are linked together. One, discus don't necessarily travel well. They tend to stress out a little bit. They don't do well with changing water parameters and their water parameter range is somewhat narrow. Now, when it comes to big time errors here, this is where, again, kind of like the German Blue Ram, it usually is an error by the fish keeper, but it's still something to consider. And it's a reason why these fish often don't survive as well as some other fish. They're more for advanced fish keepers. And so, like I said, they don't tend to travel well. The water parameters, ideally, again, you're looking at a fish that would like low to mid eighties at least, and could go even higher when they're not kept in optimal water conditions. And that means zero ammonia, zero nitrite, nitrates less than 20 parts per million they are prone to all kinds of different diseases, bacterial infections and ick, and even internal parasites. They like a high protein diet and that diet in and of itself, if you're not careful, can sometimes lead to issues, internal parasites. They, as far as genetics go, a lot of people who breed discus, they do pay attention to the genetics. So that's not necessarily an issue, but this is a fish for a more advanced fish keeper. And sometimes, like I said, problems will arise when we're not keeping these fish in the water parameters that they need. I'm not gonna lie, the reason why I wanted to do this video was for these last three fish. At number three is the guppy. How did I rank it? Travel stress of four, water parameter range an eight, disease of five, and poor genetics a 19 for 19 uh, total points. What's going on with the guppy? I think that by far of any fish that we've talked about so far on this list, with the exception of maybe the betta, guppies have been so overbred and some of their genetics are so poor for a long time, I would buy guppies at some of the pet stores and could not keep them alive. I absolutely, I actually thought I couldn't keep guppies alive, even though I had really good water parameters for them until 
I got guppies from people who were actually breeding the fish in our area and it changed everything. And all of a sudden they were easy fish to keep again. And I hear this all the time. I don't know what my problem is. I go to the store, I buy guppies and I can't keep them alive. My strong recommendation is if you really want to keep guppies, buy your guppies from somebody who's breeding these fish because a lot of times with the store-bought guppies they can be very very difficult to keep alive again when you look at my rating system for the guppy a lot of times they don't travel well and I have seen large batches of guppies and a significant amount of them don't make it now water parameters they're fairly resilient when it comes to water parameters when it comes to pH and water hardness although they would love to have a pH that's in that upper sevens to eight. They would love to have water hardness that's at least in the double digits. And that can be part of the problem to be sure. But I have those water parameters and so do a lot of people I know. And we still had issues. Again, it's probably the genetics and the way that they are being bred and way overbred, which also leads them susceptible to disease. And they can be somewhat difficult to keep. But I can't stress it enough. If you're looking for guppies, you're going to want to get in touch with a quality guppy breeder, you'll have much better luck. Obviously, if your pet store is buying guppies from a reputable source, that's gonna help tremendously. And of course, if they are quarantining for a, the proper amount of time, that is gonna help keep your success levels up with guppies as well. Number two on the list is going to be the Neon Tetra. And let's talk a little bit about why. I give them a travel stress of two, water parameter range of five, disease four, genetics a seven, for a total of 18. Now there's some things that go on with the neons and I hear this all the time from people. Why can't I keep my neons alive? Neons are absolutely one of these fish where if you buy a group, you're going to most likely expect to lose some unless you are absolutely in an area that's providing them with fantastic water parameters. So travel stress neons do not travel well at all. It is not uncommon to buy a group of neons and if they've been in a bag for any length of time, it's very possible to lose some, especially at the size that most neons are sold at pet stores when they're really small. These are actually quite large compared to what you'd normally see at a pet store. And so si the size of the neon is really going to matter. And water parameters have a big impact on how successful you're gonna be with Tetras. Again, for us in our area, if I've got a pH close to eight, my water hardness is a close to 10 on my GH and KH, and if you're similar, you're gonna have far less luck. Although neons can tolerate that, we're really getting close to the upper end of what they're going to enjoy. So once again, when it comes to the water parameter range, if you're closer to neutral with lower hardness, you're probably gonna have more success. Now, they are prone to disease. Neon Tetra disease is a problem uh, with Neon Tetras, as you can imagine. And once they catch that, it's really, really difficult to treat. And most of the neons are most likely going to die for most, especially new fish keepers. When it comes to genetics, the genetics are okay. I gave them a seven. I don't necessarily know if it's a particular genetic disease. I don't see a ton of neons that are, are really messed up, especially for how many uh, you would typically see in a pet store, but it can be somewhat of an issue. But again, it really isn't uncommon for a lot of a lot of parts of the United States that has harder water and a higher pH where you get your neons. And if you really want 15, you buy 20 and you might lose a few along the way. Number one on my list is the molly let's take a look at why travel stress of five water parameter range of five disease of three genetics of four for a total of 17. so what's going on with the molly well first of all again it's not uncommon when you see a lot of mollies being shipped sometimes they just don't make it the other issue is water parameters and this is a huge one because a lot of times when people are breeding mollies or mass producing mollies a lot of times they're breeding them in pretty close to brackish water that has a high salt content and then eventually they get shipped and they wind up in a facility or a pet store that's running fresh water and you will see what's known as what I like to call the death wobble when you see a molly that is sitting there at the top of the tank fins are clamped to its side and it's kind of just shaking back and forth at that point that fish is pretty much not going to make it and a lot of times that is due to having severe issues balancing osmotic pressure because the fish had spent almost all of its life in brackish water and then is thrown into fresh water and it's having a very hard time adjusting to those differences the genetics aren't all that great either i think like the guppy mollies are mass produced and not always uh, the the 
people who are mass producing these fish are not always paying close enough attention to the genetics of these fish because they're live bears, they're relatively easy to breed. And so it presents a lot of problems. This fish is many, just as, as important as other fish that we've talked about. If you can get your mollies from a breeder or from a pet store that buys them from a local breeder that is breeding them in true fresh water like we see here, you're going to have much, much better luck than if you are buying from somebody who bought the fish where they originated overseas, where they're being bred in brackish water. It's much more difficult to get those fish to acclimate to your typical freshwater osmotic pressures. So like I said in the beginning, this isn't necessarily going to be the case for everyone. It really depends on what part of the country you live in and what your water parameters are. Would love to hear from you in the comments section below. Are there fish that you think should make it on this list? Are there fish on this list that you're like, I have absolutely no problems with these fish. They're awesome all the time. Again, it's going to be highly dependent upon the region in which you live and where you're getting these fish. And just as importantly, where your pet store is buying these fish from. Thank you so much for being here again. We got species profiles in the description below if you want more information. We'll see you in the next one.